It's a high-tech conversation. On the low-tech topic. Live on the World Wide Web via Zoom. Bench Talk 101. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Bench Talk 101. Bit of a weird one tonight, sitting next to um, Rick, Scott, and Paul. So um, this will be an interesting one, although we will figuratively imagine Paul for the moment. Um, so... Uh, this, tonight we're joined by Mirto, who's a historian, um, and uh, she's been doing some research recently around uh, woodworking in Greco-Roman Egypt, and uh, she kindly agreed to come and talk to us about that. So I think you might all remember the planes that Richard Hughes talked about, uh, might even be almost two years ago now, and um, that was focused around planes that have been found, but maybe not so much on literature. And Murta tells me that she'll be talking about some information that she's found on papyrus. So um, over to you, Murta. Uh, thank you, Srenik, and thank you very much for the invitation. I'm very happy and very honored to be here. Um, and I, let me uh, share my screen uh, so we can get going with that. Um, Okay, uh, so uh, the purpose of my talk today is, is twofold. Uh, primarily, I hope to share some interesting information on a chapter of the history of woodworking, which I have access to thanks to my day job. Um, secondarily, I hope to feel less of an imposter in this knowledgeable community once I come clean about what it is I'm doing here. Uh, so, um, I studied classics in the UK, in London and Oxford, and now specialize in uh, the documents uh, written mostly on papyrus uh, that come from Greco-Roman Egypt. Uh, that is a span of about a millennium from the 4th century BC to the 7th century AD. So, roughly the bits after the pharaohs, when the Greeks and then the Romans occupied Egypt, and before the Arabs did. Uh, the vast majority of documents from this period is written in Greek. My interest has been mostly social and economic history, and I'm currently assistant professor of Greek papyrology at the Ionian University in Greece. So what about woodworking? Um, I always enjoyed uh, repairing and doing things, uh, but this seriously got out of hand during the COVID lockdowns, and I now seem to have acquired a hand tool woodworking workshop in my kitchen in Athens. So to mark the transition to getting back to work, uh, work work, after the lockdowns, I thought I'd embark on a new project looking for information on woodworking and woodworkers in the papyri. I was surprised at first to see that almost no one had touched the subject. Uh, sure, there is archaeological research on tools and techniques, uh, including this excellent book, uh, more about which later. Um, and several ongoing paleobotanical projects on different types of timber used in Egypt, but nothing uh, actually based on the documentary evidence of which there is a lot. Um, having now spent more than a year reading the documents and collecting the information they contain in an extensive database, I am no longer surprised no one wanted to touch this subject. Um, inconsistent, often conflicting terminology regarding tools, very elusive references to materials and constructions, fragmentary documents make this a particularly difficult puzzle to solve. But I will persevere. I feel that I'm in a privileged position to be able to read the material while also having gained some first-hand understanding of how things work. And what an added privilege it is now to have access to all of you for further inquiries along the way. So this is work in progress and likely to stay this way, but as long as interesting insights emerge, that's okay. The quantity of information for one uh, is more than satisfactory. My database already has more than 1500 entries. It is still in spreadsheet form, but so not very uh, useful to anyone other than myself, but I intend to turn it into a searchable database and open it up to anyone interested in, in that chapter of the history of woodworking. <clears throat> Uh, indeed, Greco-Roman Egypt lends itself to this investigation because, as both documentary sources and archaeological finds indicate, though wood did not grow in great quantity or variety in Egypt, it was a commodity of paramount utility. 
Uh, sourcing, preparing and working with timber called for skilled workers, as well as organ an organized trade network, since Egypt required more wood and more types of wood than it produced. Uh, in the aforementioned book about Roman woodworking based on material evidence, as well as in many similar books on other crafts um, or on woodworking in other historical periods, the contents are usually arranged thematically. Uh, Roger Ulrich, uh, in this book I showed before, has chapters on, um, uh, on, on tools, joints, foundations, framing, flooring, roofing, furniture, etc. Uh, in the book I'm working on, I decided to start at the beginning uh, and see what the documents reveal about the process that then, as now, starts from the felling of a tree and leads to an object or construction made by a craftsman. Tonight I shall skip the first steps, uh, cutting and transportation of timber and focus on its uses, which I think are the more interesting parts of this story, especially for this group. Um, I usually talk to people who know a lot about papyri and nothing about woodworking. So this is a very new experience. Um, so let me add a very quick note on the nature of the evidence. Um, papyri were made from the stem of the Cyprus papyrus plant and were the most widely used writing surface of the ancient world, but did not survive in most areas because of humidity. Uh, however, uh, papyrus documents were unearthed in vast quantities from the sands of Egypt, where they could survive because of the arid climate. Um, the excavations took place mainly in the 19th, at the end of the 19th and the 20th century. Hundreds of thousands of private and public documents, contracts, petitions, census and tax returns, correspondence, accounts, etc. Um, about 60,000 of them have been already published. The information they contained has opened up new possibilities in ancient history, with the evidence now extending beyond the accounts of court historians and including the voices of people that were hitherto lost. Uh, those that we would today call working class people, as well as mainly groups habitually not in the public sphere, such as women, children, slaves, etc. Uh, the random character of the finds means that caution is needed in the generalization of new conclusions, and especially in not accepting the absence of phenomena at face value. As a colleague once pointed out, there is no reference in the papyri of anyone going to the toilet. That doesn't mean they didn't. Um, Based both on material finds, artistic representation, and documentary evidence, we can start then with what was made out of wood, uh, before moving on to how and by whom. Major parts of buildings, uh, boats almost entirely, uh, furniture, luxury and devotional objects were some of the main categories, with riverbank fortifications and agricultural machinery also being very important in Egypt, where the economy was largely agricultural and depended on the seasonal flooding of the Nile. Uh, the documents often preserve information such as how many carpenters and or workers were employed, the type of wood used, and occasionally some of the tools. Agricultural machinery is tested in many types of documents in land leases for pieces of land that contain such machinery, sometimes describing them in some detail. In contracts for repairs, in orders uh, of replacement parts, etc. The same is true of structural parts of houses and other buildings, which we encounter in documents related to construction or maintenance, where it is made clear that the wooden parts were always the hardest ones to source. Um, uh, wood was clearly a, a rather valuable commodity, which is also confirmed by the numerous documents concerned with wood theft. And in the house that I showed to you before, um, uh, we know that the, the doors, the framing, uh, the windows, the, the, the ceiling beams uh, were all made out of wood. And the, archaeolo the archaeologists have determined that actually most of the wooden parts were removed um, from the houses before this village was abandoned. Um, um, testaments and marriage uh, contracts with dowry lists provide a wealth of information on household items which we would not normally have a record of uh, in other types of documents. Uh, chairs and containers of unguents, folding tables, utensils, boxes, baskets, cases, couches, a bed made of acacia and a barber's chair are some of the items enumerated as the personal effects of brides or testators. 
uh, temple and church inventories often mention wooden shrines, which are often carved and occasionally gilded or uh, silver plated. Pews and small tables, boxes full of myrrh, and chests for the statues of gods are some of the items we encounter. So who built all these things? Having examined the entire body of evidence, it becomes clear that the range of man-made wooden objects is vast, but the degree of specialization, as far as it is recorded by the terminology available in the sources, leaves something to be desired. <clears throat> the word that is used to refer to a woodworker in the papyri is tecton. Uh, a master tecton is an architecton, which is where ar the word architect comes from. It is a very general and very often fluid term. And distinctions such as carpenter, joiner, cabinet maker, etc., are very rarely marked by the terminology used because of the nature of the evidence where we usually see instances of construction or maintenance of larger scale projects, um, therefore um, in, in orders, uh, invoices, etc. The term uh, used to refer to someone who does the framing for uh, it, it, the, the word usually uh, um, means uh, someone who does the framing for a building or construction. But we also see the term in juxtaposition with masons and quarrymen for the laborers who worked in quarries, uh, main, mainly scaffolders. Within the craft of woodworking, however, there is no difference in the term used for those workers in wood who perform ancillary tasks in quarries, carpenters who frame buildings, and boat builders. They're all called tecton. The only specializations attested, and rarely so, are a tecton specializing in building work, a tecton specializing in machine building, so mainly um, uh, water lifting machines are meant here, and uh, a tecton specializing in precision or detail work. So I assume that the word tecton can either function as an umbrella term for any worker in wood, regardless of further specialization, or if used in juxtaposition to the specializations just mentioned, or some specializations by tool, which we shall see presently, uh, to, mean carp to mean a carpenter doing rough framing as opposed to a joiner or cabinet maker. <clears throat> now, uh, let's have a look at tools and building techniques. This matter is quite a challenge to address, but I start with the assumption that in different historical periods and in different traditions, there are bigger or smaller variations in the types of tools and techniques used but what must be achieved remains constant. The wood must be cut to size, it must be flattened and jointed, and then different pieces of it must be fitted and fixed together according to the requirements of the intended construction. So rather than locating piecemeal the, the tools mentioned in the document and trying to identify them case by case, I start by assuming that there must have been tools that fulfilled specific functions and look for them. Not finding them also tells the story, as we shall see. Uh, so I expect that they had measuring and marking tools, work holding tools, boring tools, cutting tools, uh, pairing tools, and striking tools. Uh, the first two categories are adequate, adequately attested archaeologically in the Greco-Roman period, both in the form of the material objects themselves and in iconography, where uh, rules compasses, calipers, plumb lines, and various types of clamps and holdfasts are attended on funerary reliefs and wall paintings. The documents are not very forthcoming where these categories are concerned, but by casting a wider net to include cases beyond woodworking, we encounter some measuring tools and possibly also holding tools in some documents that were found in a quarry site in the Eastern desert of Egypt, which are a wonderful resource for anything tool related, but usually fail to provide a distinction between the numerous masonry tools they contain mentions of and the fewer woodworking tools they contain. Moving on to boring tools, Depictions of drills and archaeological finds indicate that the very common type of drill used in Greco-Roman Egypt was the bow drill. References in the papyri include various terms, but the distinction again between the drill and drill bits or augers is unclear. Um, 
these two lists, uh, um, at least um, in the in the second one, at least uh, it is clearly uh, stated that uh, the enumerated tools are um, uh, carpenters' tools. Um, and these two lists lead us on, also onto the next category of tools, that of cutting tools. Uh, these are much more widely attested, both archaeologically and in the documents. I suppose that this is not by chance. They tend to have larger parts made from sturdy metal, which accounts for their ability to survive long enough to be recovered by the archaeologists, but are also not the sort of tool that a woodworker would easily make or repair himself. Thus, purchases of new tools and maintenance of used tools would be expected to leave some sort of paper trail. Indeed, most of the references to this sort of tools have to do with orders and maintenance. Uh, dull or damaged tools are of no use, so it's of no surprise that the most usual attestations of cutting tools in the papyri are in the context of the need to sharpen them or sending them out to harden or uh, repair them. Honing is something that woodworkers had to do themselves and often, we therefore find letters with orders for sharpening stones or files. Uh, here someone's looking for a a wood file, um, for a file that's not only a wood file, but also can be uh, used to file um, iron tools. Um, hardening is a, hard, is a, is a complex procedure uh, and one carried out by metal workers. And it is a service that wood workers and their employers had to outsource. While the procedure called stomoma is more often attested in the papyri with masonry tools where it is absolutely necessary. Um, harder metal is uh, also sought for woodworking uh, cutting tools. Uh, archaeological and papyrological evidence uh, indicates that this process was not in fact carburization. The Romans uh, had not adequately mastered steel making, but it was the insertion of a piece of higher carbon metal possibly imported to the tip of the iron tool by forge welding. The, the root of the term stomoma is stoma, meaning mouth, which may reflect the enclosing action of split welding the tip. But I may be overinterpreting this in an attempt to make up for the fact that in modern Greek, the term has come to mean the exact opposite. Um, uh, it, that's what we call uh, cutting tools that are no longer sharp and won't cut. Um, ancient Greek and modern Greek do that sometimes. Um, so uh, the hardening process in the in the text uh, we're looking at here is to be performed on two types of tools, uh, both described as uh, woodworking tools. Uh, the two terms here I have highlighted in different colors, so I don't confuse you with the terms. Um, but the two terms here are in other texts both habitually translated as chisels. Based on other attestations in the documents, the second term, the blue term, can be, um, uh, as, as a tool, can be in the possession of a builder, can be described as wide, and curiously appears often in an agricultural setting, most often in vineyards, where it is absolutely unclear to me what its use would be if it is indeed some kind of chisel. Um, on one occasion, it is used for killing pigs, and my joke about pig stickers completely tanks to an audience of papyrologists. Um, but that means that it must be a, a sharp instrument, um, while its etymology suggests that it must have some scraping function. The first term, the yellow term, can be described as with a handle. Uh, most of the time is connected to a quarry setting, and once the word is used to describe the metal shaft or axle of a mill. So we wouldn't obviously assume that woodworkers didn't have proper chisels. Of course they did, and we have found them. Um, archaeologically, not only are all kinds of chisels and gouges attested, but the types of Roman chisels discovered uh, closely resemble the chisels we still have today. We have found uh, paring chisels, uh, firmer chisels, and mortising chisels. So I take the presence of chisels as a given, and based on the context of each of the sources, the, which one was it? First term, the yellow term, uh, may be a generic term for all types of chisel-like tools, um, including cold chisels. Um, 
on the, whereas the 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 blue term on the other hand doesn't sound like a chisel at all and no instance of it in the in the documents would suggest that this chisel is meant uh, it's probably either a pruning or a digging instrument and i think that a lot of um, the additions that include this word have to be revised uh, but i intend to look further into this thankfully with saws and sawyers we're on firmer ground um, though, again, no distinction is made between different types of saws, attested archaeologically, they're more readily recognizable in the sources. Uh, sawing seems to have been a separate task performed by specialist workers, at least in la large-scale builds such as shipbuilding or larger constructions. Um, The, the axe is another well-attested important tool in this category. Um, and apart from the uh, expected uh, occurrences of it, interestingly, uh, many references to an axe involve instances of violence, such as uh, petitions regarding breaking and entering, material damage, or even attempted murder, as in this um, uh, uh, text here. So, an important tool that should be in this category, uh, which is indispensable to woodworkers and attested in iconography, is the plane. Uh, however, only a few archaeological examples survive, um, and it is seemingly absent from the documents. Uh, in Richard Hughes's fascinating presentation, we saw planes made of various materials. Um, here's another one from Pompeii. Um, in spite of these rather special cases, though, uh, the archaeologists assume that, in, uh, that like in most hand tool um, woodworking traditions, usually the entire body of the tool must have been made of wood and only the cutting iron added, which accounts for the scarcity of material finds. I suggest that it is for the same reason, um, since craftsmen would most probably fashion their own planes, possibly even repurposing a chisel blade as a cutter, that planes are not attested in the documents. Um, uh, there are no orders uh, or receipts, that is. No, no one seemed to have bought or, or sold any, any uh, planes or ordered any to be made. Um, uh, again, not a, not a uh, proof that planes were not commonly sold, but interesting, interesting to note uh, nonetheless, is this uh, first century AD depiction of a knife seller's shop, where we see agricultural instruments at the top row, um, knives in the middle, and racks full of chisels and perhaps gouges below, but no planes. Um, one bonus entry in this category, not in fact a cutting tool itself, but used with cutting tools, is the lathe. Not many wood turners occur in the documents, but they are probably, interestingly, the largest group of named specialist craftsmen. It is very rare in general that woodworkers in the papyri are mentioned by name, uh, but we do find people described as turners or wood turners uh, in accounts and lists, uh, in one census declaration and on a mummy label. Uh, I didn't find it. It's a, it's a, it's, it's one similar to the ones that I'm showing to you here. It, the a digital um, image doesn't exist of the specific one. Um, uh, and we also uh, often find objects uh, described as turned. Um, in the final category, that of striking tools, the terminology is again limited, but thankfully unambiguous no variation in types of hammers, uh, but mallets are referred to simply as wooden hammers and a reference to a big hammer together with a plain hammer in the list of quarryman's tools may refer to a sledgehammer. Um, in terms of using the tools, as, as far as I have been able to detect, maybe not unexpectedly, there is no description of joinery techniques in the papyri for which several examples have been archeologically uncovered. Um, we do find many references to nails and glue, though. Of course, screws weren't invented yet as fastened. Um, both metal, iron and brass, and wooden nails are referred to, um, as is the craft of nail cutting. Even an apprenticeship contract in nail cutting has been found. 
um, and glue occasionally is described as a woodworker's glue. To conclude, uh, this was an overly summarized overview of my research so far into a craft that with different levels of skill and various specializations must have been practiced everywhere in Greco-Roman Egypt, from the simple seats or table fashioned by whoever was in need of it, to great machines and sought after creations of specialist workshops in Alexandria, requests for which are found in the papyri. Um, I, I, I intend to carry on in this line of inquiry, aiming to get a clearer picture of the craftsmen, both regarding their techniques and their social and economic role, and also the tools of the trade for which I plan to carry out a comparison with other pre-industrial woodworking traditions, also incorporating information from the literary sources. And I may come to you from time to time to ask you um, whether you agree with my interpretation of specific tools and their uses based on your experience. Uh, for the time being, I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Mirto. That was a brilliant talk. Um, I think we've all enjoyed that. So um, if anyone's got any questions, um, I think you can see a few people have already popped their names in the chat. Um, if you pop your name in the chat, uh, we'll come to you. So uh, Matthias, you got in really early there. <laughs> really early. Over to you, Matthias. Thank you. <clears throat> and thank you so much, Mirta. That was absolutely fascinating. And, and I mean, you only scratched the surface for us. We want to know more. So, <laughs> so, so, so please come back and keep us updated. <clears throat> Be glad to. A couple of questions. My first one, so the papyri that you're talking about, uh, are they already indexed in such a way that you, you easily can find these references or, or do you actually have to go through the whole lot of them? Um, well, in a sense, both, but uh, okay. that's not a bad thing. Papyrology is very advanced digitally. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have fantastic databases that are searchable Every published papyrus uh, has been encoded and uploaded onto um, um, uh, specialist uh, databases that are open access to everyone, and mm -hmm. people can search by terms, by by you know dates, everything. So in fact, I do have to go through everything, but it's a much much easier task than it was 20 years ago. It's just a matter of um, specialized uh, sort of um, uh, searches. Uh, identifying the terms that I'm interested in, and then uh, looking for those terms. And of course, reading around documents that have those terms because new things come up that I hadn't mm -hmm. thought about. You can't pre-identify all the terms, you know, you, you find mm -hmm. them all the way. But it is, it is a, it, it, it has been made very, very easy for us in the, in the last 20 years. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I also got, got the impression from a part of your talks that uh, there was not only woodworkers, but that there were also tool makers. So that's a separate trade. So a professionalized tool making. Would, would that I be a correct interpretation? Yes, there are. There are tool makers. I haven't specifically look at, looked at those um, yet because I don't know where to limit them. I'm, 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 I'm interested in the woodworking tools but of course they don't necessarily specialize in what type of tool they they no. specialize in the material it's made out of so yeah. i i need to decide how to handle those mm. um but yes uh, of course they were yeah yeah uh, also you didn't you, you you said you 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 decided to skip this part but uh, could you just add a few words on on where did they get their wood so Ooh, where, where, where was the wood trade uh, organized from? Uh, everywhere, from, from all around Egypt and from abroad, uh, meaning mm. from other parts of Africa. We have different types of Afri African wood. We probably have uh, wood from um, Lebanon, and mm -hmm. we probably have uh, uh, wood from, from Europe as well. Yeah. Um, uh, everywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, depending on you know, who ordered something to be made, uh, yeah. they're, they're, you know, how much they were willing to pay for it. Yeah. Uh, you, you got some pretty, pretty uh, e expensive uh, mm -hmm. uh, woods coming in. Uh, but Egypt is, is quite wood poor. Uh, so in everyday terms, 
um, local woods were not very plenty and not very good, and they had yeah. to be used very sparingly. Yeah. Um, yeah. But we we do have we have there, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of uh, many documents about the transportation of wood and we see the transportation of wood taking place by land and by river in this mm. being Egypt and yeah. by sea. Yeah. Um, uh, so it's it's a it's a big undertaking. It's a big operation. Mm, indeed. And finally, let me just say I loved the pig sticker joke. <laughs> that was. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> there we go. <laughs> I'm very glad because I, I I sort of mentioned it to a room full of people. And there was not a peep of reaction from them, but of course they didn't know what no, the I, 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 was. So. <laughs> that was just so brilliant. So I'll, 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 I'll uh, get out of the way and let the next the next person ask their questions. But thank you again so much. This was fascinating. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matthias. Um, Got a God, I'm not used to using this laptop. Um, who's next? It's Andy Tuckwell. There we go. Hi. Um, and well, I'll just echo what Matthias said and you know, thanks for this fascinating uh, way into a subject that I've sort of looked at from the from a different angle once or twice in a very small way. So it's lovely to, to have access to somebody that I can ask questions of. Um, and the first thing though, I and mean, it's Fascinating to see how sophisticated woodworking was so long ago. And I think some people who've written about the history of tools and tool making probably went into it expecting to find primitive things in the past. But what you're showing, talking about is not primitive at all. It's highly developed. I'm letting in hardened steel into a softer metal body. I mean, that, that was the right way to go for thousands of years more. Um, and can I ask you, though, about evidence from some of the wooden ar artefacts that survive? Mm -hmm. um, and I'll just sort of share the story of how I came to care about this. Mm -hmm. um, do you know about Bill Goodman at all? Uh, it was a, a tool historian in England. Mm -hmm. um, he's well known for having written the standard reference book about British planes and the people who made them. Okay. That went through a couple of editions. And he also did a, a general history of woodworking tools. Mm -hmm. um, but he wasn't an academic as such. He didn't have access to um, archaeological research, but he did travel around and look at what was in museums and corresponded with people in other countries to give him hints about things that he could find. And as well as his history of uh, woodworking tools book, I've got a copy of this little thing, which mm -hmm. is a, a very brief introduction to the history of woodwork in general, and that includes chapters about um, Egypt, Greeks, Romans, and he's written that you know, planes haven't been found from the Greek period or from the um, time of uh, Romans in Egypt. But it did include this drawing. Um, now, that won't show very well on this camera. Mm -hmm. If I can share screen, I've got some pictures of it. Um, and I can. And the drawing of it is uh, that one. That's not, that's not it at all. <laughs> Sorry. I don't know what that is. Uh, uh, let's find the right one. Um, Anyway, the drawing that I'm looking for, that I'll find in a minute, um, is a, an exhibit uh, in a museum. And it's actually in Bristol, where I live, which is handy. Uh, here it is. OK, you see that now? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's oh, a yeah. cupboard door mm -hmm. from the period you're talking about. And Bill Goodman, being a trained joiner, Mm -hmm. not only went and looked at it in the museum, 
and he's done a, a drawing of the construction. And the construction of that is really, really sophisticated. Um, it's got mortise and tenon joints. It's got cloud grooves for the panels, mm -hmm. which, uh, and the panels have got ornamental mouldings on. So that suggests you've got flat bench planes, a plough plane, and moulding planes. Mm. Um, elsewhere in the book, in, in his other book, um, sorry, I'll just flick through these, uh, it shows this picture mm. um, from the Egyptian Museum in Cairo. The plane at the top left is a moulding plane. Yeah. Um, and... Sorry, I'll, there's a, a close-up view from a different place of a, a moulding plane iron. I mean, I don't understand the datings. We're probably all over centuries apart with these. Um, but because this door was actually in the museum in Bristol, I went along to have a look at it. That's it as it appears in the case with atmospheric dim lighting. Um, the Museum's got a, a better collection on its uh, website showing it. And then when I was looking around the other night to find these pictures, I came across a, an old archaeological journal online mm -hmm. showing a very similar door from Komwashim, which I think was on the map where you started. Yeah. Um, I mean, this just says they've got the tools, they've got the techniques, and we've invented almost nothing until electric motors in the 20th century. Uh, well, the, the, the plane is a very elusive thing uh, when it comes to the Egyptians and then the Greeks and then the Romans. And I believe that the consensus is that um, the Romans had, well, we have found some, um, uh, developed what um, a, a tool that resembles what we now um, understand the plane to be. Uh, whereas the Egyptians, um, it, it, um, it is evident from the surfaces of some of the furniture that survives from the Egyptian period that, they, that, that the surface was treated with something like a plain iron, but probably the plain itself as a tool did not look like what we understand the plain to be today, but mm -hmm. it was closer to what we call an ads plain. So uh, a tool with, a, with an outside handle and an exposed um, iron. Um, but that's, that's not certain. I mean, I'm very, very confused with planes because, OK, I, I was comfortable with assuming that the Romans had uh, nice wooden planes and that's why you know, we haven't found them. And of course, they were all um, uh, craftsmen who, who worked with their, with, with their tools and their tools were very utilitarian. And then, you know, I, I, I watched uh, uh, Richard Hughes's uh, presentation and I mean, who, who on earth owned the Goodman uh, yeah. plane? I mean, what, what was the profile of that person? Who, a, who could it, afford a plane like that? Difficult yeah. to make objects, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is like a like a gentleman woodworker of the Roman period. What? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm completely flabbergasted. I, I have no idea what that's about. Um, weird. Give me a couple of years. I may find out what what, what that's about. <laughs> but I, I I don't know yet. But I mean, is there a, a lot more um, woodwork I mean, to actually look at? I can. You, you went quite quickly over. Um, surviving pieces in houses, mm -hmm. and, um, sarcophagi and um, boxes, furniture. Uh, sarcophagi of the Roman period, um, I was about to say weren't typically wooden, but there are some. Uh, there, yeah. there is a lot, there is a lot. Yeah. It's just that I'm, I'm looking at the archeology span in a, in a sort of, um, ancillary uh, fashion. I'm not an archaeologist. So no. I'm just, I'm searching for archaeological finds to assist me to understand what is described in the documents. Um, so far, I haven't found a reference to um, uh, a, a wooden sarcophagus in the, in the document. So I haven't had to, to look at it, you know, in a, in a comparative fashion. Um, 
but there's a lot, there's a lot, and there, a lot has survived in Egypt for the same, same reason that the papyri survived, because yeah. the, the conditions uh, actually help. The, the wood doesn't decay, papyrus doesn't decay in some regions, not everywhere. Close to the Nile, everything decays. Uh, close to the Mediterranean, too. Yeah. And, and I'll just finish by saying, you know, it's great also to find that the thing that preoccupied them the most was sharpening. That's really yeah. proof that nothing's changed. Yeah. That's great, though. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much again. No, thank you. Thank you very much, Andy. Uh, who is next? It's Chester. There you go. Well, that was uh, fascinating. And uh, in some ways, I feel very sorry for you. Um, <laughs> because I think you've dipped a toe into an ocean of, uh, of information out there that could take years and years and years of digging. Um, I, I have a relative who's an archeologist who too, um, and, and they both uh, wrote books on tools and the, and the early tools, but, um, but they were basically basing their, their line on technologies. Mm -hmm. So as opposed to specifically woodworking. So you have weaving, you have pottery making, you have all different technologies mm -hmm. and the tools that were needed in those different technologies. And that's why I say that you, you're, you're just like trying to look up a family tree that's been going on for so many years and has so many branches that you're going to have to find your, your path through that most interests you. And, and you will never be satisfied because I think that, uh, a uh, hundred years of study, you, you, there'll always be something else just out of your reach. Yeah. You know, um, but that, that was fantastic. Uh, I want to mention uh, there was a couple of woods that were mentioned, uh, Acacia and the period, uh, what is it, Perseus. Mm -hmm. um, there were two items that were made of that. What got me interested in this uh, years ago was when I went to see the Alexander the Great's tomb, the pieces mm -hmm. from Alexander the Great's tomb. And the, de uh, the delicate metalwork and fine carving, woodwork, and other things that were in his tomb uh, points to uh, nothing primitive. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, then now we're talking 300, somewhere in the middle of 300 BC, 320, 350 BC. But, um, but the, the, uh, the, the tools that were buried with him uh, were fascinating medical tools, all different things, and um, and so well preserved. But that got me intrigued about where we were on a on a on a world level, a timeline of mm -hmm. of tooling, um, because you're you're referring several times to the Egyptian period, which I'm assuming was before the Roman invasion. Before before Alexander the Great's invasion, so before so like the Greeks. Uh, before 330 BC, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so I have a book on Egyptian furniture, and mm -hmm. some of the work that is still pre-Roman um, mm -hmm. is still not as primitive as the pictures that you're showing. They they yeah. had a lot of decorative scroll work on it. Yeah. Um, things that we consider, you know, some of the Greek Egyptian later is certainly more Greco. Roman, but um, mm -hmm. but some of the early pieces as well are not as primitive as we like to think in our head. We sort of visualize these primitive tools making primitive items, but they some of them were exceptional. Yeah. Um, so that's why I say you're you're you've got a lifetime of fun of searching and stuff. Um, and uh, I, I took I took some notes here. Another interesting thing I found was in the Greek language how you talk about the ancient Greek and the more modern Greek, I had that problem when I was doing research in, uh, in um, dealing with uh, Hebrew and uh, with, um, with German language. They, there were transitioning of words and, one, and, and some words disappeared over time. Yeah. So you would have a word that you have, to, you have to, you think it means something modern and then you go, no, this was before that, that construct. So yeah. um, fascinating. Uh, I'm, I, I think it's wonderful the stuff you're doing and, and appreciate the uh, the the, Thank you. the hit the, the little dipping our toe in it. 
So thank you for sharing that. And I'd love to read and, and hear more about uh, you, the progression that you're going through. It's Thanks. fascinating. Thank you're you. right about the division uh, between woodworking and other tool making uh, branches because uh, what I what I um, have a feeling about so far from reading the documents is that uh, tool makers that um, was asked about before uh, weren't specialized in one trade. Um, I, a, a document came to my mind now where someone says um, you you were you were ordering a file. Did you mean uh, um, uh, an iron file or a medical file? Because I don't have any of the latter. Uh, right. So. Uh, you know, different. And then uh, the, the way that documents refer to um, uh, specialists of different tools, like uh, uh, a sawyer or a chiseler, you have to absolutely um, depend on the context to understand if it's someone who saws, you know, belly timbers of ships or uh, stones. Uh, or a chiseler, again, if it's someone who, who works uh, with wood or works in a quarry. It right, and that's that's um, the specificity of just the tooling and the mm -hmm. woodworking and the carving and these other crafts are one thing, but in this in this book that that like I said my cousin wrote, first two mm -hmm. chapters are on technology and culture mm -hmm. because you you can't really separate the two; they're they're intertwined, sort of sewn together because you have those craftsmen, but they're treating. Uh, and they're doing their work for a specific culture that they live within. Absolutely, yeah. So, so you wind up with not only the uh, the technology, but also you have mm -hmm. to add in the sociological aspects of the timeline. Absolutely, and in Greco-Roman Egypt, that that is that is not easy because you have the Egyptian tradition, and then you get the Greeks who come and bring their own you know, aesthetics, and then the Romans come and bring their own, and you have this multi-layered thing in, in language and in art and, and in woodworking, obviously. I mean, um, from household uh, things that archaeologists have uncovered, there is so uh, much variety in material culture uh, stemming from all uh, cultures. And you have the overlap of all of that, too, absolutely. because they didn't necessarily come in and say, okay, the end of this civilization, we're going tomorrow, now we're doing it this way. So exactly. there was an overlapping and a learning from each other. And that's a difficult thing to put into a timeline because you don't know when those changes came about. Yeah, yeah. And, and people used to think, you know, the, the um, uh, older generations of uh, researchers were talking about Romanization, uh, but this is no longer um, uh, a term that is used because it's not like the Romans came and um, everything else disappeared. You know, they they imposed their culture. Uh, it was a, an osmosis. They it, it went both ways. So new things were created as well. So you can't find uh, the roots of everything in an older uh, yeah. civilization. It's a it's a, a new condition. The, so. the last thing I'll add to this because I see mm -hmm. someone else has, has come up with a question, but um, is the um, is the it amazes me is that those tools that you showed, particularly in that relief carving, is so similar to some of the uh, the early oh, American really? tools that we use today, the ads, the bowl ads, the saw, mm -hmm. the bow saw, all of that, that, that um, it's, it's fascinating to look at that and then wonder which civilization brought what mm -hmm. to the party and what carried on and how were those influences so similar across the world? Yeah. How did they relate? They didn't, uh, you know, you know, anyway, thank you so much. Uh, it's, you, 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 that was wonderful. Oh, I'm so glad. <laughs> Appreciate it. Thank you very much, Chester. I think we're on to uh, Stephen. There we go. There we go. Um, love the talk. It's just wetting the, the, the taste buds for more. Um, <laughs> The, the, the one thing that I've learned in doing my research, because my, my focus is from 1850s back in time mm -hmm. as to doing research on technology of tools, is that traditionally fathers teach sons or grandfathers teach fathers, mm -hmm. teach sons, teach their generation and so on. And tools get handed down from, from 
from that uh, the upper generations. And in Egypt, prior to Alexander, Egypt was a trading nation. So it wasn't like suddenly the Greeks show up with their new technologies of tools or the, or the Romans or whatever. Whatever was out there, if it was unusual or had a value, a trade value, it found its way into a ship's manifest. Mm -hmm. And, um, but I, I think that with, because whenever there's an archeological TV show on cable, Discovery, National Geographic or whatever, where they're focusing on the new tombs that are being opened up within Egypt. Saqqara. Mm -hmm. Borrow, uh, barring the, the uprisings and all that kind of stuff, which just mm. things disappear and it, it, that's, that's horrendous. But what's interesting is that they're finding the, the tomb complexes of the workers. Hmm. And the question is, are they finding any hand down tools within those tombs? Because it's, it's usually to honor the person, they're going to have to have something in the afterlife hmm. to work with, and so on. So either it shows up in paintings, or, or uh, some form of not real, or mm. in the case, you know, depending upon the person's wealth and prosperity, you may actually find actual tools. You find a lot of battle stuff and all that. Mm. But the handworking of tools, I think, is, is, is going to be exceedingly difficult and if, until they can really find what the, that person did in the, in the tomb of the crafts people themselves, because they were not wealthy. They mm -hmm. were Joe average citizens, slaves, uh, but masters of whatever they did is mm -hmm. obvious because my wife and I, we've gone to the King Tut exhibit and, the, and King Tut, what we call King Tut II, which mm -hmm. was the lesser things that weren't included in the original King Tut uh, show that traveled throughout the United States. Mm -hmm. And I took a lot of pictures of furniture. Yeah. And the joinery was of high quality, which tells me that they had the tools necessary to get to that level. And um, those <laughs> tools probably will never be found. And the reason is you've mentioned that if it's organic material, wood, and the soil, it's not in a really super dry climate, they'll rot away. Um, I'm guessing that the irons will not be placed in the tombs because they're being used by the next generation or the third generation after that person has been old and retired. Um, so cave paintings or the tomb paintings, uh, mm -hmm. the engravings those are the things that that last so do you read hieroglyphics not well uh and not for this anyway i i i did take some hieroglyphics uh, at university i can very you know i can get by in a very rudimentary fashion but i i i don't read um uh, hieroglyphic sources for this uh, research oh you're you're dealing with the greek Translate. I'm dealing with the Greek, not, not just because I'm proficient at it, because right. um, after um, Alexander occupied Egypt um, for the next about a thousand years, the official yeah, the language Ptolemy, of Egypt was, was Greek. Yeah. The, 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 yeah. The Empire. And the, then the, yeah. the, the, what survived the, the three or four destructions of the great libraries in Alexandria. And um, but as as Chester mentioned, you just stepping into a yeah. deep well, and and I wish you luck. Uh, <laughs> and you. I'm looking forward to future talks with a group and sharing sharing some of the uh, your findings. Is she going to publish? Um, and and you mentioned a book. 
early on in your talk. And could you lift it up and show it? So oh, yeah. Uh, uh, you mean the the um, the one uh, about Roman woodworking, the archaeological? Uh, yep. Or do you mean that, the one? That, um, that's that's yeah. that's a good one because you know technology doubles at a certain mm -hmm. rate depending upon the mm -hmm. the wealth of knowledge and i call it the leisure time that means when you're not out there growing food and trying just to survive the more leisure time there is the more societies have a tendency to develop new things but it's at the end you still have somebody who builds it yeah. and and that becomes that becomes the critical focus of, of technology okay. is the builders mm -hmm. and um in in those days technology was probably doubling every 500 years or so or more now mm -hmm. technology doubles every two and a half hours yeah. on the planet and that's why we have all these big computers that store all this stuff there's no way to go through it it's only trying to find it and that's why i'm interested in your database or yeah. knowledge when you when it put it out there. Um, uh, well, I'm I'm working towards a monograph, and I'm there there I'm I'm there are discussions about the publisher, but I'm, I'm not I'm not ready to well, no, <laughs> uh, announce this in, on, in, on in YouTube. Having yet. your findings be accessible yeah. um, so that we could do searches in it, and the inf you yeah. mentioned a couple of other databases. Um, that have that are open to the general public to do searches and mm -hmm. if you could include that information in the chat absolutely um, they they, they, they don't to tend to have many translations unfortunately they, it's going to be the the papyri in greek but you can have a look at you know how many apprenticeship contracts there are or how many orders for wood there are and things like that from the from the titles titles tend to be in english or German or French or Italian, um, but the texts tend to be in Greek. Um, well, but I, yeah, I can because it's I can... coming from the Greek period, and yeah. nowadays with these things or these yeah. the phones that have translation language translation programs, copy, cut, and paste makes life a little bit easier in trying to get through some of that information, but not from ancient greek but hopefully it's coming <laughs> you never know uh, yeah. with ai yeah, yeah. you can teach it she had another book um i'm sorry what uh, my wife is asking me a question you, you had another book before the the uh the roman book the, on tools mm. was there another, another one before that one book on tools. or was that from one of the chat people uh i think it may have been from one of the chat people oh, um uh someone mentioned bill goodman oh that was, uh, that was um i thought she had and the book i mentioned question. steve was from the hand of man by robert spear primitive oh. and primitive and pre-industrial technologies but that was that's um that's about really tools but but not as early as Egyptian, but it goes into the cultural aspects of it. Well, you know, and, and that gets that gives you the hints. Um, you know, it's like when we had a, a meeting many you know, a year or so ago where we talk about final tool marks, um, witness marks when you buy a piece of old furniture, looking for the lines and measurements, the things that were left behind by the craftsperson. That's the kind of stuff that you look for is like, okay, they made this joint. Well, how would you do that? Using the print, you know, and you keep going and, and you reduce the, um, the options to find the absolute simplest. So, mm -hmm. you know, not only, you know, when, when we, we think planes, but they also had profile scrapers where they would scrape a profile on a, uh, a blade of copper and scratch it slowly but surely scratch away you might remove the bulk of the wood with uh, a chisel or something like that but then you use a scratch tool to give you that extra shape and that would be unique for probably that project and it was that person making multiples or uh, they take the order uh, mm -hmm. i think the gentleman by the name of bernhardt 
I think who was one of our earlier speakers, he manufactured rulers from various technology or societies. And one of them mm -hmm. was uh, a reproduction of King Tut's uh, measuring sticks that were mm -hmm. found in his uh, broken, because that's the way mm -hmm. you break the ruler. Uh, um, and we saw an example of that actually when the Queen Elizabeth's funeral, and they explained it at least in the local news, they talked about it. And he recreated it exactly. So a cubit, a palm, a thumb, the fingers, the human body parts. And the thing is, is if you were going to have a, 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 a society where things that somebody else built had to fit into something somebody else built, you had to have a standardized measurement system. And um, your fingers, if they're fatter or thinner than somebody else's, if that's what you relied on, mm -hmm. things would not go together well. And when the, you know, when the, the religious and the pharaoh and the royal families wanted something, that was what they were, um, that would be a there would be uniform measurements anyway these are the mm -hmm. kind of things to be looking for I, I i just love looking at the individual who who do these who did these types of projects anyway i'm i'm done mm -hmm. i'll well, let you this was that a subtle hint um, <laughs> anyway thank you very much excellent excellent talk and we're hoping for more <laughs> You're very kind. Thank you very much, Stephen. Over to you, Nick. Hi, hi, Murto. Um, you've obviously taken up um, woodworking yourself. I'm really curious. Has that has that helped you in your research? Uh, that that has brought about my research. Really. Um, I, I would have never thought about looking at woodworking before because I, you know, it wasn't in my radar. Of a human activity. So uh, once I started um, trying to make things myself by hand, I, I started wondering how, you know, um, the period that I'm looking at um, for my other research from other points of view uh, handled that task. So um, I first read this book that I have shown a number of times now, and uh, which is a very, very good book, but is only about material culture. And I thought, hang on, I have access to all those documents that actually mention the people who made the things that he uh, he's showing. So I, I think it's it's about time someone supplemented what we know um, from archaeology uh, with, with what has been written about. And I, I hope it can be interesting to do that. And, and what and what um, I didn't realize it was that way around. I thought it was the other way around. So what um, what inspired you to woodwork? Uh, what 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 got you going about woodwork and, and uh, making stuff yourself? Um, it's, it's very prosaic. I was stuck at home during the lockdowns and I started repairing things. And then what? I started uh, about uh, wondering about how some tools that I had always been scared of worked. Um, and, you know, I, I think the first step was overcoming my, my fear of power drills. Um, and then I, I thought they're so much fun. And I, I started putting shelves around my house where none were needed just for the fun of putting <laughs> up shelves. And then I thought, okay, how, how about I actually make some prettier looking shelves than I, rather than buying a slab or whatever and just putting it up. And, you know, then I, made a, a, a bread box and you know then, then I just and then I made my bench which is the biggest thing I've made um and uh yeah it, it's on from from there uh, it, it, it's good it's good to have both isn't it the, the the academic and the practical absolutely no I I, yeah. I don't think I could have even started with the academic side of, of this uh, subject without having some pr practical understanding of what the tools are, because even with having some practical understanding of what the tools are, sometimes I can't I can't understand what what the documents mean because the, the terminology is so yeah. confusing. Yeah. So. Uh, 
I, I think I, I really I, I really need to do this now because there there can't be that many woodworking papyrologists. So I you know I, no. <laughs> I probably have to do it now. It's um, a small market. <laughs> it's, it's quite niche. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nick. And uh, I think we're on to Richard Hughes. There we go. Ah. <laughs> yeah, good evening, Matt. Uh, I, I just wanted to say uh, thank you so much for, for coming to, to speak to us tonight. It's uh, been most interesting. And um, uh, I hope you'll um, uh, uh, come back to us from time to time when you've discovered new and interesting things. And uh, I'm sure we'd all very much appreciate seeing uh, any, any new discoveries that... Um, that you make, yeah. in particular, if you if you discover any, or anything um, uh, that would uh, uh, give enough clues to um, to to construct um, the replicas of, of ancient tools, I'd, I'd be delighted to, to find out about it because I'm always on the lookout for uh, for um, ancient tools to to make copies of and uh, and uh, discover for myself how they how they work. Yeah, that that would be great. I will definitely get back to you about the the plane situation. I, it's still very perplexing to me where where are all the planes in the documents. Uh, but uh, uh, once I once I look for them a bit more, we'll we'll talk again. <laughs> yeah, uh, very good. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and thank you for your talk. I I've watched it twice now. It's very very okay. good. Okay. Oh, thanks. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Since I've made a few things since then. Um, I'd, I'd like there's. Uh, there's this one here. So this is a this is a Roman plane that was that was found in um, in uh, uh, Ober Utfeld uh, in uh, in Germany, um, and it was discovered. There were there were um, it was an archaeological um, digging up of, of a um, a Roman villa, and this was found under the floor in a in a hypercoast or, or heating duct. So there were, there were two of them. There's the, the, there's the big one. And the small one. Is that the the? It's wood, right? I can't see where. It's wood. Yes, the, yeah. the, the original plane. Yes, it's wood. It's wood and uh, and and. Well, I mean, it's a mild steel. It, it was made of, mm -hmm. uh, of wrought iron. The mm -hmm. uh, the original. Um, yeah. So. Um, it's really. Yeah, beautiful. they've been. They've obviously been been hidden there, but they they, they were recovered in quite good con condition, um, mm -hmm. and they're now in. Um, I believe they're in a museum in Trier in, in Germany. Oh. It's, a, it's a good Roman city, Trier. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. And um, yeah, uh, I was able to find, um, I think, three academic articles in, in German about them. And I, I corresponded with the, um, with the authors of a couple of them. And they, they were very helpful in, in, uh, in providing me with, uh, with details. So, um, so I was able to, to copy them quite closely, I think. Beautiful. They were the mo Fantastic. most recent Roman planes I made. And uh, <laughs> I've also got here is, is an Egyptian chisel. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, so this I, I, saw, I, I saw the original of this in the British Museum. It was in a glass case and I photographed it and uh, it's made of bronze and, uh, and wood. So I was, I was interested to make a... a a, a bronze chisel and and uh, could see if I could. Uh, um, how, how effective is a bronze chisel? It's it's not as effective as a, as a steel one, but it's better than you'd think. Um, the, the way they, the, the way that bronze is ha is, uh, is hardened is is to uh, is to hammer it. So oh, so okay. by hammering it on 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 the, on the end, it, it it gets harder, and then you can, you can then you can sharpen it in the normal way. It doesn't take quite as good as uh, good an edge as, as steel, but it's uh, it's usable. And well, we, indeed, we know that the, the Egyptians used bronze tools for a long, long time before um, before they had iron or steel. No alternative. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Excellent. And uh, can I ask you? Do, do you have a theory about who owned the Goodman and Plain? Who? Well, all right. The, yeah, the good man, good man and plain. Um, the, the original was was made of uh, of ivory. Um, mm -hmm. I think probably probably uh, uh, well, the, either walrus ivory or um, 
or, or elephant ivory. And, and obviously that's a, that's a very unusual and, and costly substance to make a, to make a plane out of. And um, you only think that, I mean, it was, it was clearly a plane that was designed for, for, um, for high quality work. It's got a very high angle blade, which, which works well on them. Um, on uh, hardwoods, but not on so on softwoods, and so it was it was more of uh, more like a um, what we would, we would call um, panel plane rather rather than a, a jack plane. Um, mm. But as for the ivory, uh, you can only think that a, a very wealth, wealthy person had an interest in uh, in um, in woodwork, or, or perhaps it was a presentation to the master of a of, of a guild uh, at, at at some point. But, uh, that might be a yeah, because yeah, I mean, hobbyist woodworkers is not something you see in the bibliography. <laughs> yes, yeah, but, yeah. but, but be, being ivory is is yeah. that, that's the reason it's it survived because uh, yeah. Yeah, as you as as we know and as you've said before, wood, wood doesn't last very well mostly uh, underground, and so. Yeah. I'm sure there are a lot more wooden planes there, um, and, and and they were used for general general woodwork purposes. It's just that the the, the ground conditions have made them disappear. So that the ones that um, have survived, I think it's 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 a, it's a, it has um, skewed really what um, what we see. So yeah. the, what the ones of, of ivory, of, of bone and horn, um, they they survive, and the, and the wooden ones haven't. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you again. And uh, yeah, we, 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 I'm, I'm sure I speak for all of us as, uh, to say that we, we, we'd love to see you here, here again and, uh, and and find out some more about what you discover. Thank Once you I have much. more, I'd love to. <laughs> thank you very much, Richard. And now I hand over to Scott. There you go. Thanks, Marto. Um, I just want to say, same as Richard, um, that was a great talk. Um, it's, it's always interesting to hear from different countries. Um, we don't have many people joining from the Middle East or anywhere like that. Um, so it's, it's amazing to hear and your knowledge on like historic, um, tool, using tools and stuff like that and uh, woodworking is amazing. Uh, I thoroughly enjoyed your talk. Um, Nick asked you about, did it influence any of your woodworking or anything like that? And you said that you were still new to it, but do you have aspirations on, I see you've got a nice, you've got some tools hung up and you've made a bench. And lots of shelves, but what, what do you, what, what's your aspirations? What do you see yourself doing? Um, I just enjoy I, I just enjoy making things, and I enjoy sharing this uh, journey with my six year old son. Um, maybe because it makes me feel very good that he doesn't realize that everything I teach him I've only learned the day before. But <laughs> uh, you know, we we make toys together. Where is it? We just um, we're trying to make a tumbling man together. Oh, um, nice. He's not tumbling the right direction, but we'll we'll, I've we'll, seen, <laughs> we'll figure it out. Yeah, uh, very difficult to get to work properly. If, if, yeah. yeah, very difficult. But um, uh, I think I think you brought it up now. It's perfect that for your son that making toys with your son and, and then seeing him actually play with them. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, he's more interested in in the making bit. I mean, he using the mallet and bashing the uh, the dowels in was his favorite bit. Then he lost interest with the tumbling action. That's a, that's a journey that's only going to be continuous. To you said he was six, I think. So yeah. as as he gets older, the, the more the more you introduce him to tools at certain ages, the more used to him he'll be. And you think about if you'd started woodworking at six years old, where where you would be now. Absolutely. Uh, um, a lot of us do with interest, obviously, and uh, that interest is hard, harder to maintain in children. But uh, yeah. if they're making toys, that's where this, that, they, they then, if you showed them a picture or something, then he could, uh, maybe he couldn't see that that's a toy he could have. And then yeah. do that journey together, actually making that would be amazing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, Thank yeah. you again. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. It's amazing. Really, really good. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Scott. Now I'm going to find Will. Uh, here we go. Hey, how are you doing? Here we um, go. Thank you very much. This is great. I love history and um, the archaeology and, um, and the stuff. I'm just kind of settling into hand working, uh, hand tool woodworking myself. Um, 
but one of the things that with the mystery of the planes disappearing or uh, assume it disappearing is if a plane and its iron were um, either no longer functional, um, I have a suspicion that the iron may have been recycled. Uh, because I, back then, my understanding is iron wasn't a common commodity and was still relatively, I don't want to say precious, but um, in demand. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I was thinking is, because we do it ourselves, people in this group, is, is we, we, we sort out um, old tools and we, we often up, upcycle them or recycle them onto new tools too. So they might have just disappeared into the, you know, either remelted down or just converted to something else as well. Um, scrapers, for example. Um, who knows what? Um, so just to keep that in mind. Um, and and the, he touched, uh, I can't remember if Andy touched on this, this is the Bronze Age tools and tools from the Mesopotamia um, and that kind of stuff. The um, Sumerians slash Arcadians as Assyrians all had a lot of documentation um, mm -hmm. with the uh, cumiform. Have you, I don't want to broaden it so far, do you know of anybody looking at that stuff? Uh, I know people are, uh, you know, in, in terms of woodworking, you mean? Or, yeah, or uh, no, tools. no, then no, no, I don't, I don't know if anyone's looking at that. I, I should, I should look into whether uh, there's... Uh... Because it's, it's sort of like some of the other gentlemen uh, mentioned is, is having the whole context of, mm -hmm. we're, see, we're seeing stuff, like when you showed those, uh, the Egyptian Roman chisels, right? Mm -hmm. If we recognize them, yeah, right, yeah. right, and then and it's kind of it's kind of cool that um, you know the saws and stuff like that. Um, it's kind of getting the context of you know nothing's really new. It's just kind of a different style, like the Romans. I think they had a different height of bench. It was a lower bench, so they pushed it on it. And it's just kind of interesting about that, seeing if. Uh, you got your piece of pie is big enough by itself, but also I'd love to see the context other people are doing with it. Is to, to, if you come across them, let us know. Yeah, I will. I will have a look at um, you know comparative data. I haven't. I haven't uh, uh, gone that far yet uh, with with Isn't other pre-industrial societies that had to solve the same issues. You know, starting with the with the assumption that the 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 range of stuff they had to do was pretty much constant um, yeah. and how they solved similar problems must have been at times similar so uh, i i want to I, I want to check the veracity of this statement but but uh yeah i remember seeing it was one of those british archaeology this week i think it was with um what's her name um they had done something up in scotland or northern england and it was in a bog or something like that and they pulled out i believe it was a bow drill yeah. that in, in itself had been turned yeah absolutely so, and that yeah. and that was that was very old i think it was stone age or something yeah. like that but to, just seeing that they had essentially something i could put together in my shop and I've been thinking about that actually, is um, that somebody's been using for thousands of years. Yeah. It's, it's, it's actually kind of awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Will. Um, I think this is a great time. Just uh, four minutes through, four minutes before it's midnight where Moto is. So... Uh, <laughs> Just getting the crowd around me and uh, time to raise a toast to the bench. So uh, thank you, Moto. Thank and you. Toast to the bench. Bench. To the bench. Put it down the bench. Thank you very much for staying up so late. <laughs> it's my pleasure. Absolutely. Uh, Most fascinating. Thanks, Moto.
Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. You're all very kind. Yeah. <laughs>